a list of the of the speakers of the seminar within the documentation and a short uh, biographic note of each one of those so that we don't need really to do a very long introduction of each speaker also um, excuse me for a second we've distributed uh, small cards uh, to each one of you so that uh, if you want to make any comment or suggest any major conclusion about all the sessions, we'll be picking up those cards and distributing uh, new cards for each session. So please, uh, if you have a few ideas, a few comments, a few questions that you want us to consider as a main message from each session, please write that down. We will be picking up those notes, those cards, and we will be dis distributing new ones for the following sessions. Okay, it seems that uh, we are now uh, ready to to begin uh, Professor Munier's presentation. Um, he's a professor of the Sorbonne University, and he's been uh, chairing a few interesting programs in France, mostly on uh, risk management, risk analysis. Uh, we, we've seen on Professor Munier's uh, uh, great contributions in the field of economic theory, risk theory, and we thought it was important to provide us uh, for this uh, keynote address some uh, keynote, uh, some uh, scientific, sci um, theoretical <coughs> components and, and, and some um, uh, introduction for the upcoming presentation. So uh, please, Professor Munir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you first for have, having invited me. Uh, my two main mentors in my careers repeated constantly that existing models and existing ideas should be always more critically reassessed than they actually are. They were Oskar Morgenstern, who was my professor when I was graduate student at Princeton, and Maurice Allais, who is uh, one of the uh, Nobel Prize winners. So, everybody among you will tell, of course, we all do this all the time. Well, <coughs> granted, but what's the result? Well, let me show you that this is not uh, always uh, evident. This graph shows you the actual price of wheat, and it shows you what projections have been made with existing models. And you can see one thing, that whatever the year where the projections were made, they all were wrong. And they all did not say minimize volatility. And uh, the excuse is that, of course, these models, which is true, are not designed to study volatility and to predict volatility, but designed to predict trends. Even on this level, I'm not sure they are always correct. So what just Professor Guido says is certainly in need. So what is volatility? There are <coughs> many ways to measure it. Just uh, here, uh, um, right? oh, yeah, okay. there are, there are, um, there are three ways. Uh, this is the standard ways the financial people do measure it on financial market. Uh, this is the standard, well, not the standard, but the frequent way economists do measure it. And here I will concentrate, because I think it is more important, on extreme volatility. And I will measure it in terms of, li like the, the financial people, but in terms of a number of standard deviation. Because the importance of volatility is whether it is really extreme uh, or, or not, and you will see why. OK, <coughs> this is a computation that I did on 12,000 observations from January 6, 1970, until last January, two, two months ago, day after day, you see 
uh, what the volatility has been in terms of standard deviation. So you could say if I listen to uh, uh, standard economic theory, it should have stopped about at this level. So you can see that uh, uh, obviously it is uh, well above. Uh, and why is this interesting? Because contrary to what I I I I accepted wisdom, the volatility of our years here is not completely the same as in the 70s. Uh, when we look at graphs like the one Mr. Hanyoti showed on uh, yearly averages, we could believe it, but I will show you that it is not on the next graph. Second, let me show you that this is the white line here is the tendency. Uh, the tendency uh, is not clear recently. You see that there is some inflection here, uh, but on the other hand, uh, nothing uh, prevents me from saying that uh, the phenomenon is not necessarily going to fade away. Um, so let me show on the next slide why. <coughs> this is a similar, uh, can you see it? Because no, no. You, you should not be discriminated against. <laughs> uh, this is the same thing except that it is cumulated. Okay? And this shows two things. Uh, this here is the financial market. It is the Dow Jones. And here I compared with the um, index of uh, the Standard & Poor's and the uh, uh, index uh, of uh, agricultural commodities. So the interesting thing is that at some uh, time, at some, in some period, you see these two curves diverge widely. Like in the 70s, which means what? That the commodities are uh, getting much more volatile than the financial market. In other periods, you see that the curves are more or less. Uh, the uh, number of uh, exactly what I showed before, what is the, the volatilities, daily volatilities above 2.5 sigmas. OK, yes. So here, uh, the extreme volatility, in, in fact, if you want to call it that way, OK, uh, the extreme volatility is, is uh, far more increasing on commodities uh, as it, it has been here, OK? And uh, the last year is, is a year where the tendency is not clear, and it seems to, it seems to temporarily to slow down, but nothing uh, proves that uh, it will continue that way. I believe that there is a good chance that the contrary happens. So y we might enter a, a period where uh, volatility is not increasing much in either uh, market, but w I that period might be of uh, not necessarily a long one, and, and it can start again. We, we can start again periods like this one or like this one. So let me show you on these two uh, periods that I distinguished here, about nine years in the 70s and 10 years in the recent years, uh, why it matters uh, to uh, in the way we, we measure volatility. Uh, <coughs> this is the first period, comparing uh, commodities and the Dow Jones and uh, the commodity index and the Dow Jones, and here is, is the last period. They're almost of the same importance. And you see that if you take, for instance, the standard uh, economist way of measuring it, you can say, well, it's above this about the same thing, 10% is uh, uh, not, not much. But if you take uh, the number of extreme events, in fact, it has been sensibly increasing, uh, and much more so on commodities than on the financial market, which says what? That the, the only reason why we cannot compare volatility in the 70s and in the 2003 to 2012 period is that the structure of the volatility is not the same. 
in our period, the number, the, the, the volatility has been uh, uh, very small and then extreme and then very small again. And the percentage of extreme uh, volatility is much more important in the recent period than it was in the 70s. And that is the issue. Because when is food security in danger? When you have extreme price spikes? Uh, when are uh, farmers' existence in danger? When you have extreme spikes in prices? And um, I think that uh, looking at daily volatility is not a bad idea because uh, when you sell your crop, you choose to sell it whatever market you could sell it on, uh, forward futures or uh, spot, uh, but you choose to sell it at one point, one day, and you don't know what next day price will be. And uh, uh, so it's important. So why is that? I think there are two combined grounds. Uh, one, uh, commodities markets have widely changed. And one reason why I think they have widely changed is the financialization. I know that Mr. Anutis has said, you know, whatever and so on. What you have, what have you, well, what have you is very important. And it is very important because correlations uh, have widely changed. The reason why CFM, oh, CFMA is Commodity Futures Modernization Act, I suppose everybody knows that acronym. Uh, we, we, we use too, much, too many acronyms, I agree. Uh, it, it was introduced in 2000 in very odd circumstances on which I will not dwell here, but it changed widely uh, the markets. First of all, new participants, of course, uh, have been entering markets and the weight of options markets has been, uh, has increased considerably, at least from time to time. And I think that this is not without relations to the extreme volatility. Not always, of course, but uh, we have some information that almost 80% of options contracts are on OTC markets. And markets, uh, so, so when we show uh, the importance of uh, uh, contracts on uh, the Chicago Merck or whatever, uh, this is just the uh, small portion of uh, emerging above the sea, but the, the main portion is on OTC market. Uh, and these markets are networked. I mean, clearly, uh, you have uh, places where information is channeled, uh, people are in relations, and clearly London, New York, uh, Singapore, and Hong Kong are places, uh, especially New York and London, uh, are places which play a, a, a very important role. Uh, information is way then perfect on uh, outside this and uh, there are I mean contracts on, uh, on, on, on OTC happens much more through negotiations uh, so that we have multiple price equilibria and the closure of the market is not a closure in the Varajian way where you know prices adjust to make uh, uh, global demand e e equal to global supply. We have uh, evidence, a uh, lot of evidence contrary to that, uh, where, uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, prices going up while uh, uh, demand is much uh, lower than supply during a, a, a certain period. Um, okay, uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is uncertainty is close to Hicksian. That is to say, uh, people don't believe in frequencies or distribution of historical probabilities, like uh, the financial people put it. 
and I refer here to some of the recent papers on this, but there are many. And so behavior towards uncertainty has changed, and it includes ambiguity aversion, okay? So that the beliefs, even based on historical probabilities, become non-additive beliefs. The, the, the one of the standard the references for economic theory is Do and Verlang paper in 1992. And you know that when you have this sort of uncertainty, the standard result of financial theory that you have one single um, 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 uh, how do you say, um, objective probability distribution is not true anymore. And you have a, a, a set of, so that, uh, uh, so that um, uh, this is a justification for having a, a multiple price equilibria. So these two factors together should be modeled. And what I want to maybe try to do now is to explain to you how we tried to do, even if it is I consider myself as that what we've done is still unsatisfactory by far, but somehow more satisfactory than what I show at the beginning. First, we introduced uh, uncertainty in uh, so we decided to, be to build a world model, which is, uh, which is uh, a, an interdependent um, uh, model, not, not, I would not say a general equilibrium, because uh, it is generally interdependent, but it is not general equilibrium, because most markets are not in Valrajian equilibrium most of the time. Um, <coughs> and here, it says only, how do we do this? Well, uh, the anticipated income from each farmer, we tested that somehow with some farmers, is uh, uh, not, not necessarily the uh, expected uh, value of uh, the historical distribution, uh, whatever that distribution, by the way. But it has to be, it takes away one risk premium, which is standard uh, f f in the, the Newmanian theory. But here the risk premium uh, is weighted by um, a theta parameters, which depends on what? On how fast recent incomes have grown. For instance, when the, the incomes have increased or, or, de or decreased losses uh, in, in recent years, uh, faster in more recent years than uh, in the year before, then people become optimistic and correct expectation upward. If the contrary is true, the correct expectation in the other way, okay? So it is one way to relate the, for those of you who are familiar with decision theory, the uh, celebrated uh, 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 community prospect theory, if you want, uh, with macroeconomics. Okay, uh, then the expectations depend on the price uh, anticipated, uh, depends on uh, the anticipated income with respect to the last income realized, uh, and uh, it takes the last uh, price, the price of last year, say, and it weight this with some vague knowledge of the equilibrium price. So it means that people are caught between two uh, polar attitudes. One is to say, well, last year is, more, is very important, and the way prices have actually developed should tell us how they will continue developing. And at the same time, well, there is an equilibrium time price sometime, and if the price departs from that equilibrium, it should come back to that equilibrium. Well, in the first place, the equilibrium price, they don't know 
if they don't know what it is. And in fact, if we were conducting a poll among the, the, the very learned people and the practitioners here, and if I, was, uh, if I were asking what the equilibrium price is, I don't think I would have many answers. So people are caught between these two, uh, these two things. And uh, so, uh, they, uh, again, uh, this is uh, one way to introduce in models what has, uh, should be introduced. Uh, then, from that anticipated price, we have uh, an anticipated supply. And of course, that supply is uh, corrected by natural risk. Natural risk here is introduced in each zone of the world according to the variations of returns okay, in that zone, uh, the average, of course, and, uh, and then we have a demand. And OK, the theoretical equilibrium price is here, but it is not very well known to most people. So the natural risk is modeled uh, because <laughs> uh, uh, it, it is difficult to, to do uh, otherwise as a, as a normal uh, law of uh, uh, mean one and of some uh, sigma, and, and the sigma depends on the zone, okay, uh, depending on zones where uh, natural risk is very important and has a wide impact, and other zones. Okay. Uh, just to justify the way that the equilibrium price here does not play the role it plays in most models, okay, uh, I refer to the author. Varas himself said the equilibrium state of production is like the equilibrium state of exchange. It is an ideal state, not a real one. It never materializes. An important sentence that many authors should have read another time before building their models. OK, we have also to introduce in our model short-term investors. I'm not saying that they are all speculators. I'm not saying this. I'm just saying that they can be very useful. In m many cases, short-term investors on financial markets provide uh, counterparts to uh, producers willing to sell forward their crops, and it's very useful. But at some points, their expectations polarize in one direction, and then they become dangerous because they're mostly speculating and destabilizing markets. So again, it is not a question of quantities, of mechanical functioning. I'm not writing a nice function, explaining how this happens, uh, you know, with nice uh, periodic uh, 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 attitudes. I'm just saying that it is a question of expectation formation. And one of the reasons why our commodities market have become complex is because they have become markets of expectations, not markets of quantities. You know that when Mr. Medvedev says, I'm not going to allow exports of Russian wheat in the next month. The next morning, the next morning, before he can sign uh, what he said, before he can do anything, the price of wheat is soaring. So it is a market of expectations. It is not a market of quantities. And still sticking to our supply and demand scheme, is really uh, making, uh, I think, a mistake. OK, so how do short-term investors decide? Well, <laughs> I decided that there is a gap, GT, between the an anticipated price of, well, it's difficult to, <laughs> uh, b the anticipated price of peasants and the price of last year, and clearly, this price anticipated by peasants is communicated to investors. So they have a better, they have an asymmetric information scheme. They have a better information than, than farmers because when they start deciding, they know what farmers anticipate. Why they do they know, th know this? Well, because they see whether farmers seed more or less or uh, how much they uh, decide to use uh, um, in such or such production. 
uh, and so on. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> it's very simple. We have two sorts of short-term investors. We have the naive ones. The naive ones believe that if the price was lower last year, if it is higher this year, it's going to be higher next year. And the fundamentalist one, again, the fundamentalist one are those who know perhaps more uh, the equilibrium price and the theoretical equilibrium price and say and who say, well, if the price soars, then it's going to go back to equilibrium. And all the problem is how much naives and how much fundamentalists you have. Well, the proportion of naive here is determined by that function, and that function is very simple. It just says that at the beginning when the price soars a little bit, you have more naive than fundamentalist, and when the price continues to soar, at one point, naives stop to believe that the price is going to go farther up, and fundamentalists become more numerous and say, well, the price has sold too much, it will come back someplace. Okay? Okay, this is not a scoop. This has been done by many authors, and it is a simple way, uh, but an effective way, to model investment. Uh, and in fact, if, if we were, all of us, uh, inquiring uh, how we do uh, with our portfolios on stock exchanges, we should acknowledge that much of that rule is uh, inside each one of us. Then how to do it? Well, to have an interdependent model, we used what I call here a central module, which is what? Which is a model, a standard uh, general equilibrium computable model, okay, computable general equilibrium model. And the only thing is that the way agricultural prices were formed, uh, this is the whole difference. The way agricultural prices are formed is being killed in this model here. Uh, agricultural prices are formed uh, with the characteristics I have showed you in, in, in a parallel module, which I call the risk or uncertainty module. So it works that way. First, the risk module determines these e agricultural prices. This uh, model, which is very standard, runs under the constraints of prices previously determined. It yields uh, several data back to uh, the risk module, and the risk module runs again and determines the new agricultural prices. So this is agricultural prices at t minus 1. This is agricultural prices at t. Uh, of course, this model does not pretend to deal with daily <laughs> variations. We prove here uh, yearly averages, which hide a lot of things, but we cannot do any better. Uh, okay, finally, what do we get? Well, we get a history of prices, which looks like this. If PR t minus 1 is the price of last year, PR t, uh, it's here, okay, PR t is the price of this year, well, the price change is has three sources. First of all, it has the sources of what farmers expect, which is very standard, and how natural risk correct after what, what farmers have thought they would produce, like to produce, okay? And then it has, of course, the impact of short-term investors. Um, well, this is technically a nonlinear difference equation, which results in price movements, uh, of course. And if, if initial states and parameters were adequately chosen, that would be a chaotic model. So it would be f absolutely 100% unpredictable, except like uh, some uh, probability distribution. Well. Uh, it is not, because uh, 
uh, initial states and parameters are not chosen by a mathematician, <laughs> but are given by uh, the figures one can find in the literature. And we use the data, GTAP database uh, for uh, most of uh, our model. Just to make it in a different setting than with equations, let me tell you, below this line, this horizontal line here, uh, what you see is what is taken into consideration by most economic models. Uh, of course, natural risk, effective supply, resulting prices, effective demand, all that is done, clearly. But the point is, what are the drivers of this? What are the drivers of that? That is not taken into consideration, and that's above the line. And that's the idea that the market has become a market of expectations and anticipations, okay? And this is a way we have to introduce, I believe, this is what behavioral finance has done, this is what behavioral economics has done, this is what agricultural economics has not yet really done. And introduce these psychological factors, drivers, into our models. Okay, uh, our models distinguish 12 zones in the world. That's uh, it. In the first, in, in a version which we published two years ago, it had only five agricultural sectors. And it, uh, uh, now it has more uh, sectors, not only of agriculture, but of commodities, because we added oil and gas and metals. And by the way, one of the results of CFMA, uh, CFMA was uh, uh, taken, was adopted, because for the financial people uh, at the turn of the 2000s, agricultural, well, commodities in general, were almost entirely correlated with financial asset prices. Today, they're completely correlated. And they're completely correlated because the investors have become predominant in teaching prices to the market. Uh, okay, let me show some of the simulations we have, we can do with that model. This is the baseline simulation, uh, it, which means, baseline means that we, we assume that present conditions will continue. Uh, you have here a, uh, the thick, thick black line on the left side is the FAO index of cereals. Sorry, I, this one is on cereals, but I will change, I promise. I'll go to meat <laughs> in one minute. Uh, this is the monthly index, and this is our back uh, retrospect simulation, if you want, in yellow here, okay? Uh, uh, starting in 2007. The reason why it starts in 2007 is because uh, the version three of our model rests on GTAP database, GTAP 8, database and GTAP 8 starts in 2007. So the previous <laughs> version was starting in 2001. This one starts in 2007. Uh, on the right side, you have the thick black line is uh, the, the hour projection, okay? The, uh, the uh, small, uh, the thin uh, lines are uh, different scenarios uh, and the dotted thick line is OECD projection, okay? So you see that the, in this case, we agree with OECD on the trend. Uh, we don't agree on uh, volatility. Okay, we assume what, we, we, we try to assess what supply shocks would do. So assume here you have a, which, which almost happened in 2013, by the way. Assume that you have a 7.5% increase in world supply of cereals. Uh, and s assume that it happens again in 2015. Hypothesis. 
what happens, what happens to the previous uh, uh, simulation. Well, it happens, of course, <laughs> a deep uh, uh, plunge here. Uh, prices are uh, serial prices are plummeting uh, uh, here and here. Um, and by the way, it uh, almost uh, uh, corresponds to what happened, not quite, but uh, let's say uh, prices of uh, cereals have bec have come about up to that down to that level of 190. They haven't gone down to 150, but it is, uh, with respect to the 300 line, it is a, a, a quite nice result. What I don't like here, and what I will, uh, uh, we have to do to improve our model, is that after the plunge there is uh, a, a sore which is uh, too important. Yes, I'm finishing. Okay. Uh, okay, so I just said this. Uh, I will skip that and I will finish by, okay, this is a, a simulation about Alina, uh, about the, uh, the free trade, uh, American uh, European Union free trade uh, uh, hypothesis. Um, we assumed here that uh, everything was continuing in the world except that tariffs would be zero, which of course is not in question, but just to make the hypothesis simple <laughs> and, and clear cut, uh, we assume that tariffs would be zero between the US and the EU. So what happened is that, uh, first of all, it doesn't decrease uh, uh, volatility. Uh, and second, uh, the curves relative to each country evolve uh, uh, differently, which means that there is a question of terms of trade which should be important in, in the discussion. Uh, the organizers of this meeting had asked me to look at what about volatility if there is an increase in meat consumption in emerging countries, okay? So I've tried <laughs> to do something um, and uh, about uh, livestock meat price uh, and livestock and meat price. Um, so this is here. Uh, in this graph you see on the the thick uh, black line uh, is the FAO index of meat price, and the dotted blue line, uh, thick dotted blue line, is our baseline uh, simulation. Well, it is not a back, backward simulation from 2007. It isn't that bad with respect to what happened. Um, and uh, a few countries here uh, have been uh, uh, simulated. And this is here Mercosur, which, is a very vol which has very volatile prices even in livestock. So, this is the baseline. But what happens if, say, consumption in meat increases by, say, 20% just to make, again, hypothesis clear-cut, which is an extreme hypothesis, but in, say, China and Brazil. Well, here is the result of simulation. And you have to look at meat, what meat becomes. So uh, meat is very volatile even in China and in Mercosur, even the, in the baseline, okay? Much less in the European Union and the, in the Alena. Uh, so the shock is here, and the result is not much for Alina, doesn't change much. This is of the, of the uh, say, uh, of the size of the error. Uh, in Mercosur, similarly, in European Union, it increases, if anything, it slightly increases volatility, and uh, in China, uh, about the same. Uh, as uh, we look for oil, uh, to oil seeds, because if meat price increases, then uh, oil seeds would have to move somehow. And oil seeds are also are very volatile everywhere. Um, there are specialists in this room. Uh, <laughs> 
um, across the world, this is uh, uh, the uh, FAO index, it's very volatile. Uh, Alina uh, would see uh, the volatility slightly decrease, Mercosur slightly increase, the European Union sensibly decrease, and China uh, slightly increase. So uh, this, I think, to has to be explained through uh, uh, private uh, inventory behavior in these countries because here I'm talking about volatility. I do not say anything about the level of prices, but clearly the level of price of mean and old seeds will increase if there is a jump in consumption. So uh, I finished by regulating such a system, such a complex system, well, and on that I agree with what has been said before, uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, point one, I repeat here that I think that volatility as such, if it is a small volatility uh, constantly repeating around the trend, is not the issue because everybody expects this and it's been there for centuries. The issue is extreme volatility and that is an issue which has been more important, I say it again, uh, in the last 10 years than it has been in, uh, in the 70s. Of course, we can find in history periods in the 1500s or the 1300s where there's been even more volatile than that. But I refer to what we know uh, in our modern world. Okay, extreme volatility has three sources. The spark is the fact that farmers are make boundary rational decisions. B farmers cannot guess exactly, even on average, what the equilibrium price of next year will be. That is just and simply an ideological story uh, that theoreticians have invented. I have believed in that 30 years ago, but with 40 years experience, I don't believe in rational expectations. Sorry for the authors. Um, so farmers made boundary rational decisions. Then there is natural risk. And of course, natural risk may just increase the discrepancies that this creates in case, and, and in this case, the spark is turned into a fire. Okay, and if, uh, in addition, you have short-term investors having, at the moment, expectations polarized in one given direction, then the fire becomes a, a brand, as we say in German, or a wildfire. Uh, third, Hicksian uncertainty is largely produced by behavior of people, by farmers and by short-term investors, which means that the reasoning which is be beyond WTO DD, uh, uh, and partly beyond DDF, not completely, but beyond WTO, which is, well, if we increase, if we, if we decrease, uh, uh, say, commercial barriers to trade, then prices will stabilize. This story is just would be true if the instability would be exogenous in different countries and not correlated with each other. Of course, when you believe, like it was the case with Newberry and Stiglitz in the, in the 80s, back in the 80s, that all uh, volatility is caused by uh, natural risk, then this is an acceptable reasoning because there is no reason why if there is a drought in, say, France, there is, would be a drought in Australia, okay, or conversely. I accept this. But if risk is not caused by a natural exogenous reason, but mainly by the behavior of markets, because markets have been changed and changing, then this reasoning is not true anymore. Uh, it might even be the contrary, because when you free the circulation of good these years, you also free circulation of short-term capital. And we have 
forgotten, uh, I'm finishing on that, but it is an important thing. We, we have forgotten the 1945 lesson. When I was a Princeton student, we were reading the assessment of the interwar period by Ragnar Nurks, and we had lessons of interwar currency experience. And the conclusion was for almost all authors, uh, free the circulation of goods, but control the circulation of short-term capital. And today, for other reasons, I believe that we have completely forgotten that lesson. And so policies could be reassessed based on some of the ideas I have, uh, uh, well, on the ideas I've just uh, transported here into agricultural economics for a while. Uh, <coughs> Uh, of course, no, no single country solution. Everybody has said this already, so I won't insist on this, because every country solution has an impact on international price and so on. But don't forget that finance is at the core. Uh, and even I believe that it may call for a revision of in international institutions. 1945 was one thing. The 2000s are quite different. FAO should perhaps be connected with F IMF or uh, Italian. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Munier. Uh, we have time for questions, so uh, uh, please, um, I'll take note, uh, okay? Thank you. Uh, what you presented is, is a rather unorthodox uh, model, and uh, I have several comments. Uh, first of all, I think it's unfair to dismiss the Agling and all the other models just like that. And I think they are not designed to deal with volatility. They are designed to deal with trends, as you said. And I uh, said whether it. Whether they're good or not is another story. Yeah. Uh, now. Well, I think they should no, be no, dismissed if they finish. are not good. Please <laughs> let me finish. I, I'm finishing. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now uh, the you you have also uh, indicated a model, a non-linear price model, which is uh, new. Let's say I wouldn't say if it's interesting or interesting, but it's new. But I think it needs a lot more theoretical justification. Right now, you postulated the model; it's an interesting model, but it needs more theoretical as well as empirical um, verification. For example, what's this rationale for the theta and the functions that go into this theta that you mentioned? I didn't understand that at all. Uh, then uh, you did something highly unusual. You combined a, a CG type of model based on G type version with a price module which is designed for short term. Now, I was not clear how exactly you did that because the data or the graphs that you indicated just presented uh, uh, the things. Now, the veracity of any model, as many of the model builders around here will tell you, is by looking, and since you're trying to do predictions, not just simulations, uh, it is uh, on ex ante uh, verification. In other words, if you estimate your model with data, say, five years before now, and then test the model whether it tracks the five years, then I would believe it, because right now, you cannot say that this model does any better predictions than anything else. Simulation, fine. Simulation models uh, can do anything we want them uh, to do. Uh, but um, I still uh, think that uh, the, uh, I, I, I could not see how the tool, the CGE and the other things, are related. And you did not show us any statistics on how your model predicts volatility any better than uh, other models, okay? So I think I'm, I'm finishing with that. Thank you, uh, Professor Saris. Uh, perhaps you want to take uh, one, two, two questions? Well, can I or you, you two sentences? Please. Yeah, okay. Uh, the first is, of course, you're right. Uh, I did not say, well, f first of all, uh, justification, I mean, theoretical justification would need much, much more than one half hour. I mean, we published the book, and there is 70 pages on this. Uh, on the previous version, which I would dismiss today and, <laughs> and replace by some other, but you're right, it would need some more justification. Okay, if there is any precise question, I would be ready to answer it. 
Second, uh, when you say, of course, this is crucial, that uh, how did we uh, assess the parameters in the model? Did we assess this from previous data and then run the model or not? This was one of your questions, right? But you said how you did that. You took data from the literature. You took parameters from the literature. That's fine. We do that a lot. But if you want to have a predictive model... You I don't. I don't think that this is a predictive model. This is a simulation model, and the only thing it predicts is, according to the conditions, what can we expect for volatility and only for volatility. Yeah, but the model does not say anything about volatility the way you define it. Volatility is, you define it in terms of data. Okay. This is not a data Excuse me. I, I don't want to... I mean, I'd like to allow more people to raise questions. Okay. So, Professor uh, Yes, uh, we disagree. <laughs> Along similar lines, I don't understand why you assume that you, the central planner that you asked for uh, in your last slide has more information than market participants collectively have on what is, is to be expected to happen in the markets. Could you, could you reformulate the question? <coughs> you asked for a central planning planner. Yeah. You asked for government market intervention in your last slide. And I don't see why the government... Did why the I central ask planner? For central planning. My goodness. If I did this, then I am ready to die. <laughs> okay, just before the last uh, one. See the where your call is for short, short-term capital oh, controls. Oh. You know, controlling for short-term capital is central planning. Is that what you said? Government market intervention. That's central oh, planning. Oh, it is a government intervention. And fortunately, and there is government why intervention. Would your, why would your government Mr. have Hanyu more information than market job. participants? That I don't understand. Maybe you can clarify that. Your, your, your government has more in information about the future than market participants. Okay, okay. I see the question. The standard question of uh, uh, ideological liberals. Okay, the government has less, less idea. Okay, well, I don't think that our farmers are badly informed, okay? Uh, the short-term investors are badly informed also, and I know that from, I would say, almost practice, okay? I meet them all the time, so I know what they are and how they think, and they're really poor. Um, uh, and still make money contrary to what uh, uh, theory says. Uh, now, uh, I think the government has some information, at least as far as shorter capital movements are re uh, concerned, uh, I think it can do something help uh, helpful. Yes, okay. I do. Thank you. And I'm not the only yeah. one. <laughs> Please. Adam Ubaldi, European Commission. I have a small observation on over-the-counter markets. You quote this 80% threshold. Don't forget that the, uh, on the Matif contract, options were 0, 0.00 something in 2007, and now on the Matif, the most important market in Europe, it was 18 or 19% in 2012, but I don't have the figure for 2013, but could be 25%. So, question. Is it a success of a policy intervention, the Barnier package, MIFID, MAR, EMIR, the architectural infrastructure markets, or was the market to anticipate the policy, first? Second, it's a critique on the way you assess the um, issue of extreme volatility. If you go to a large scale measurement, volatility is often measured as coefic uh, coefficient of variation. Yes. Correctly done. If you go to very short interval, you have the microstructure noise. Mm -hmm. So the shorter the time horizon in the, in the measurement, the volatility skyrockets easily. The not volatility, the realized volatility skyrockets. You correctly placed your analysis in the intermediate layer, which was the daily level. But for day, you, you know that for the uh, daily observation, and you, you, you do the, 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 the comparison with the financial markets, mm -hmm. the distribution is not normal. Oh yeah, of course. So you're calling extreme volatility a measurement of how many times you go n times the standard volatility, a number which is not really on on a stable distribution, which is the model, sure. the, the current model. How, sure. how, how, can you, how can you defend this choice? Okay, uh, you, you're quite correct, and I try to express this, that we 
could not do any better than dealing with yearly averages, okay? Because on macroeconomy, on a macroeconomic basis, if you have a solution for a daily basis, I'm ready to come and take, a, and take notes of what you will teach me. But I don't know how to do it, and I never met anybody who knows. Okay, yet I think it is an important issue. And I think that uh, what I try to do is spot the sources of that and try to say, if we decrease this, of course we will decrease by the same way the averages, the yearly averages, okay? And if we control, if we, if we manage in such a way that yearly averages are, lo are, are lower, well, presumably, if we tackle the right sources, presumably the daily uh, variations will also be. But that's all the only thing I said. Uh, I accept your criticism on this point. But I don't know how to do it better. Thank you. Jose Maria? Yes? Thank you. Jose Maria Sumsi. Uh, I would like to not uh, ask some question, but comment. And it's about the policy implications of your uh, model, but not just your model and other models. The main Publications as a festival is no single country solutions. We need uh, joint actions. And the second is finance is at the center of the problem of the volatility. I agree with these two conclusions, but I think that these two conclusions are very bad news. A very? Very bad news. Bad news. Mm -hmm. First of all, because my own experience is the question of the joint actions is the question of uh, global governance for food and agriculture. And I, 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 I saw in the summits of 2008 and 9 very difficult to find solutions that joined people, joined countries. Even the CFS in the FAO is progressing but very, very slow. Even the G20 solutions are progressing very, very slow. Then if the solutions should be joint solutions, joint actions, uh, my scepticism is very high. And the second, finance is at the center. Of course, I agree on this conclusion. But it's a second bad news. <laughs> because the agreement, even within the G20 in the Cannes summit, uh, is progressing very slowly, too. You know that all the regulations on OTC are progressing very difficultly and very slowly. Very bad news. Thank you. Uh, okay, just on the first point, uh, even if you don't believe in global governance, which is perhaps a far away objective, I agree. Uh, at least uh, some coordination, it was said before, uh, could, could be a second best to that. And that's, uh, again, uh, one thing for which I'm calling. Uh, just because uh, there are, you know, some countries which believe still that due to a uh, vision of supply and demand, if we had big stocks, we could stabilize. I mean, this doesn't mean much. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Tarsis Nguzimana, uh, working for European Commission in the Joint, s the joint Research Center of ISPRA in Italy. I have two questions of clarification. Yes. Um, in your model, uh, the prices that you, you model is function of uh, three components, farmers' expectation, risk, natural risk, and uh, short-term investment. Yes. So what about long-term investment? As we know that this component is very important on the supply uh, side. The second question is, I have seen that in Momagri, you work on different areas, uh, uh, yes. and in Africa, for example, I have seen the Zone 7. Uh, are you using yearly data? Because in these kind of areas, the seasonal component is very, very important if you want to model the high volatility. Thank you very much. To okay, uh, as far as long-term investment is regarded, I would say <coughs> these are say, medium-term models. Volatility is not a 50-year, we, we, we cannot pretend to, to assess what volatility will be in 50 years. I mean, we can pretend to say what it could be in two, three, four, four, five years if uh, we change this or that conditions uh, in the market or in tariffs or uh, whatever. Uh, but 
uh, not in the very long term. So um, uh, introducing uh, long-term investment, I, we have in our uh, scientific uh, uh, council, we have Mr. Uh, uh, Ganem, who used to be at the FAO, the uh, chief economist, and uh, we discussed that issue at the, the last session of our scientific council. And uh, of course, we could introduce long-term investment, which is very important for underdeveloped countries uh, because of the infrastructure uh, question, uh, which is crucial for them and uh, for the formation of prices. But that would make the model and all directions model. I believe in models which are designed for a very precise, go for a relatively precise goal and uh, I think we need another model to, to do that. Okay, this was for the long-term investment and then uh, for the African countries, well, <laughs> Uh, I tell you, uh, we use the data from the database we have, and sometimes we have to complement it by data taken from uh, the country itself, but uh, we do what we can. And it is not particularly easy with uh, uh, Central and um, uh, South uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. <laughs> but we do the what we can. No, no, no. We use we use uh, yearly data. Yes. Uh, this is George Opsomanikis from FAO. Uh, Professor Mounier, you also cited our work on volatility, which means we are on a good path. Uh, I don't want to put a question on how you model animal spirits uh, now, but your statement that animal spirits have changed <laughs> uh, from 1974 and uh, to 2008, which I understand as the economy changes, the transmission mechanisms are different. Yes. Uh, however, in 1974, there were no commodity indices. There were not over-the-counter products. Yes. Uh, the future markets were in an embryonic state. Yes. Though there was a boom, and there was a boom from all commodities, food, yes. non-food, metals. Yes. Yes. How would you explain that? Uh, would it be that this takes the finance off the core and brings other fundamental drivers like the money supply? Well, uh, I would say uh, two things. First of all, uh, there was a, in 1974 a natural risk accident which was extreme. And second, some of the commodities were already financialized, for instance, sugar uh, was uh, already. And uh, I would say this together can explain the peak uh, you have in 1974 or, or slightly before. Now, uh, I remark again that even, even though if you take the standard ways of measuring volatility, you find something approximately equivalent in the 70s and in 2003, 2012 periods, uh, again, the structure of volatility was not the same. And the reason why structure of volatility is not the same is because precisely I believe that animal spirits and market conditions have been changed. And we could, by the way, this is reassuring because it means that if we want to do something, we know that we have caused what happens, so it's not very difficult to come back. Thank you. The last question. Yes, uh, I am Javier Diaz Bay from Argentina. Yeah. You're talking about Mercosur yes. a lot of time. Uh, when you was talking about uh, food um, uh, volatility travels now in, in the world, you're talking that we are in a over expectation market more than in a quantity market. Yes. Do you think that the international organizations uh, have learned about that or are, uh, understood that? Uh, I haven't to judge what organizations have understood or not. I'm not the organization. Ask the organizations, not me. <laughs> I don't have to, to, to I mean, I, I cannot you give any judgment on, on the international organizations. But do you think that we are in, in the correct governance? Well, for 
Uh, not quite. I believe that uh, organizations, international organizations, we have today correspond to the 1945 situations. And they were meaningful then. The world has changed. Why would, should we stick to exactly the same division of international organization? For instance, WTO uh, has to do with trade. Doesn't have to do with agricultural production. It doesn't have to do with uh, financial capital movement, okay? Uh, or except uh, for uh, maybe uh, calling for the freeing of that. Um, uh, for instance, uh, FAO deals exclusively with uh, the, uh, well, say, physical aspects and economical aspects of uh, agricultural economics, but it doesn't deal at all with monetary issue. Uh, monetary policy is, in terms of prices and of levels of prices and of volatility of prices, has a lot of responsibility. FAO cannot do anything about it. So I um, just suggested that it might be uh, a good idea to reassess this division of international institutions. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. Okay.